Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. Once again, it's my pleasure to tantalize you with a mystery. And not a whodunit, but a, so to speak, why done it. Frankly, I much prefer the why to the whodunits, because they're just so darn difficult to solve, if you manage to solve them at all. For example, why... But no. Let Rose Corbin, our heroine, ask the question. But why, Hank? Why would anyone commit murder because of this coat? I don't get it either, Rose. It's just a plain, ordinary imitation leopard skin coat. We know that. Well, do we? Why, what do you mean? I, I mean, this coat has been the cause of more than one murder and, and, and attempted murders. It may look plain and ordinary, but, Rose, it, it can't be. Someone wants this coat. Wants it badly enough to kill for it. And, Rose, do me a favor, will you? What favor, Hank? Stop wearing it. Our mystery drama, Roses Are for Funerals, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by George Lothar and stars Carol Shelley. It is sponsored in part by Sinoff, the sinus medicines, and Anheuser-Busch Incorporated, Brewers of Budweiser. I'll be back shortly with Act One. Well, now, I'm not going to make the mistake the famous mystery writer E. Phillips Oppenheim once made and bet that you can't solve this mystery. You know what happened to him. You don't? Well, he bet his readers a large sum of money that they couldn't solve the mystery. And many of them did. So, no bets. Tell you what I will do, though. I'll play fair as always, and make sure you have all the clues I have. Every single one. I'll even tell you when you've got all the pieces you need to put the puzzle together. And nothing can be fairer than that, right? Okay, then. Let's start at Kennedy International Airport in a passenger lounge where a very attractive young lady named Rose Corbin sits patiently waiting for her cousin, Hank North. Pardon, mademoiselle. Yes, please. May I introduce myself? My name is Simon. Simon Lavo. Yes, please. I must talk quickly, very fast, because my flight has already been announced for Paris. What is it you want? You will think it is such a foolishness, mademoiselle, but I, I wish to buy your coat. You wish to buy my coat? The coat I'm wearing? Yes, please. It's a strange thing to ask, I know. It's a very strange thing to ask. Especially when you're wearing the same kind of coat. Oh, no, 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 it's not the same. Well, yours is real leopard skin, of course, while mine is only imitation. Uh, a different style, oh, too, but... Please, let me explain, and then I know you will, you will agree to my very strange request. Well, you can explain, but I'm not selling you this coat. Please, mademoiselle, the, the problem is my sister. She's my twin sister in Paris. Vous savez, elle est très pauvre. She, she's very poor, and she's married to a man who does not make much money. I'm sorry about that. Please, vous en prie, vous en prie, please, listen. When we were children, my sister and I always wore identical clothes. Dresses, coats, hats, everything was the same. And so today, when I buy something, well, like this coat I am wearing, which I bought here in the city, I always buy for her a, a, a duplicate. Well, oh, it's very thoughtful. It's very kind. But you see, I, I'm very selfish when I see this coat. I want it. Oh, I, I, I want it so much. And so I said to the salesperson, I will take this and, and another one just like it. Of course, for my sister, you understand. But, but mademoiselle, there is not another one like it. So please, quickly now, eh? I have only a few minutes before my flight and... Come here, Sakut, eh? How much did you pay for it? How much do you wish for it? I'm sorry, but I just don't want to sell my coat. One hundred dollars, eh? After all, it's, it's only my touch Look up. here, even if you offered me two hundred... But wait, mademoiselle, no. no. Please, please, try to understand. I must have it. Well, one thousand dollars, one thousand... For an imitation leopard skin If you're so concerned over your sister having a coat like yours, buy her one when you but get to Paris. It's too late, mademoiselle. She's meeting at the airport, and she will say, where is my coat? And they should I'm to... sorry. I'm really very <sighs> sorry, but... Please, here, one thousand dollars, and I beg the coat. Please, what are you doing? Take oh, your hands off. Please, please, will you? Don't you look, you talk. Oh, you ridiculous. Hey, 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 cool it. Cool it. Yes, I'll be happy to if one of you is <gasps> Rose Corbin. So that's me. Are you Hank? Hank? 
Yeah, that's uh, me. That's me. I was pretty sure you were Rose. You're wearing that rose in your coat lapel. What is all of this? Well, this woman insists that I sell her my coat. But they have offered her one thousand dollars. Yes, but if my cousin doesn't want to sell, you you don't want to, do you, Rose? No. Well, but I do not have time to argue. I shall miss my place. Please, please, I beg of you, send it to me. Look, I'd I'd better find a cop. No, 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 no don't do that. Please. Well, then you must be on your way. Please, the court, the court, I must have it. Okay, okay. There's a cop over there. No, I'll no, just no, go no. and. No, no, please, I'm going. I, I, I'm going to over. Oh, thank you, Hank. I'm so glad you came along when you did. She gave you a hard time, huh? Well, she tried to tear the coat off me, even ripped my lapel. <laughs> she put a kind of crimp in your rose, too. Broke the stem. I might as well throw that away, and now it served its purpose. Well, there's no need for that. Uh, look, I, I think I can reprint it. Oh, thank you. Let's see. Say, it's still pretty fresh. In fact, it's very fresh. After an eight-hour trip from London. Oh, I didn't get it in London. I got it here at the airport florist when I landed. When I told you I'd be wearing a rose so that you'd recognize me, well, I decided if the girl looked wilted, at least the rose didn't have to. <laughs> <laughs> well, there you are. Good as new. Oh, thank you. Except for your torn lapel. Mother will take care of that. Okay. I've got your bag, so uh, let's, let's go. Fun city awaits you, Cousin Rose. Hank? She seems to be awaiting me, too. What? Oh, the French girl, see? She still hasn't gone through the flight gate. She's standing there looking at us as if, well, as if she was still hoping to buy this coat. Ah, forget her. The world is full of nuts. Let's go. Well, yes, we have bridges in London, but nothing like this, Hank. The Triborough, you said? Yep. Yeah. Look over there. How's that for your first sight of New York City? Oh, it's sensational. It's too bad you didn't arrive at night. That skyline all lit up. It's out of sight. I'm sure it is. Oh, Hank, I'm so grateful to you and Aunt Ruth letting me stay with you on my first trip to the States. Letting you stay? Now, happy to have you. In fact, now that I see you, I'm delighted to have you. And very glad we're cousins twice removed. Why? Well, it makes us kissing cousins. <laughs> I hope you're right. About being second cousins, I mean. Personally, I can't figure it out. Maybe you, with that lawyer's brain of yours. Hey, what in... What is it? What's wrong? That car next to us. Hey, watch it. <gasps> hey, man, you're too darn close. Oh, good heavens, they certainly are. Crazy fool. What are you doing? Get over. Oh, we'll have an accident. But we sure will if they don't... <gasps> Well, they got the idea. They're pulling ahead, thank heaven. They're pulling ahead, but right in front of us. Now, what in Hank, the... Hank, look out. They've stopped. Oh! oh, oh Rose, Rose, are you okay? I don't know. I... Hey, hey, what do you think you're doing? You, creep. Me? Yes, you. Give me that. Oh, never mind. I'll take it. Hey, take your hands off her. What kind of a nut are you? Let her alone. Oh, he's trying to take my coat. Get your hands off her, I said. All right. Uh, uh, Hank, Hank, you've knocked him out. No, 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 Lee. She's getting up. Come back here, you dirty creep. Hank, don't go after him. He could be armed. You could be hurt. Get him back in his car. Get the license. Stop. All right. Quick, Rose, the glove compartment, pad and the pencil. Right. Uh, jot the number down. Quick. He's burning rubber to get away fast. They tried to kill us, Mother. They did. I know they did. And, and he, the man who jumped from their car and ran back to us... He wanted my coat as badly as that woman at the airport. Believable. Altogether unbelievable. It's incredible. That's what it is. Now, just a minute. You say she was willing to pay $1,000 for it. For imitation leopard skin. <laughs> but she wanted it and had to have it for her twin sister? Yeah, well, I, I don't buy that, Mother. Uh, this uh, second attempt to get a hold of the coat. I mean, by a guy who was ready to kill us in an accident if it turned out that way. No. There's something about that coat. Something somebody wants. Yes, but what could anyone want with an imitation leopard skin coat? Would you buy it, Rose? Harrods in London? I wish I knew how to straighten out the mystery of Rose's coat. Oh, dear. You don't straighten out a mystery. You solve it. And I ought to know. I've read hundreds of them every year. Oh, most of them, too. <laughs> well, try solving this one, then, Aunt Ruth. Oh, well, as a matter of fact, I've been thinking. And I may have the answer. You have? I just may have. Would you bring me the coat, dear? Of course. I won't be a minute. What do you think of her, Mother? Oh, she's beautiful. And she's just so charming, so poised. 
She may not have much money, son, but she does know how to wear clothes. And with a figure like that, uh, the clothes wear her. <laughs> well, I don't mind saying she's exactly the sort of girl I hoped you'd marry one day. Yeah, well, in that case, I'm, I'm glad she came over. I'm glad you invited her. Oh, that's why I invited her. <laughs> Here it is, Aunt Ruth. Thank you, my dear. Oh, this rose you wore is wilted, poor thing. Small wonder. It's really taken a battering. I suppose it just decided to give up. <laughs> Mother, what are you doing? Now you know my methods, Watson. Apply them. I'm examining the lining. The lining? Oh, no, I could be wrong, but it wouldn't surprise me if something were hidden in this lining. For well, what, for goodness sake? Well, let me see. Certainly not jewels, or I'd be able to feel them. <laughs> You're going over that lining like an expert, Mother. Well, that's what comes of being a mystery story addict. Oh, wait. Not heroin, either. <laughs> heroin? Oh, it's been done. Well, not anymore, though. The customs people were under that, oh, ages ago. I'll go. Uh, now, if heroin were concealed in the lining, mm -hmm. I'd be able to feel the, you know, the crinkly little glassine envelopes. Oh, what? There's nothing hidden in the lining. Nothing I can see, anyway. Oh, was it paper delivery, dear? Yeah. Now, why are you looking at the front page? It's... As if you've just been shocked out of a year's growth. Because it uh, could be I just have been. Hank? Wh Listen to this. Headline reads Woman murdered on Paris bound plane. What? A, a woman identified as Simone Laveau of Paris, France. That's her. That's the woman who wanted to buy my coat. Yeah, I know, I know. Just listen now. Was found dead in her seat aboard flight 219 for Paris late this afternoon. An hour after takeoff, a hostess, Andrea Klein, noticed that Miss Laveau was slumped in her seat and thought she was asleep. She secured a cushion to place behind the young woman's head and on doing so, discovered she was dead. Oh, no. Oh. Further examination disclosed a deep knife wound in her left side. Since the flight was only an hour out from New York City... Hostess Klein recalls that a man was seated next to her just before takeoff was nowhere to be found on board following the discovery of the murder. What does this mean, Hank? I'll tell you one thing it means, Mother. I'm going to police headquarters right now, and I'm taking that coat with me. Yes, but Hank... Rose, a woman who was willing to pay $1,000 for this piece of imitation leopard skin was murdered an hour or so later. Why? A man neither of us ever saw before nearly killed us in a crash on the Triborough so he could get this coat off you. Why? Well, we'd better find out why. Be because... Yes, because... Uh, I could be wrong. I hope I am. But this coat... It could be a death warrant, Rose. Whose? Yours. <laughs> course, you're thinking. So Ruth North, Hank's mother, examined the lining of that coat and found nothing. So what? Obviously, the coat contains something. Maybe it does. Then again, maybe it doesn't. In fact, to be absolutely truthful with you, no. Why should I be? You have all the clues. Use them. I'll be back shortly for Act Two. I'm sure most of you will recall the famous incident when Sherlock Holmes said to Dr. Watson, consider, Watson, the curious behavior of the dog. And Watson said, but Holmes, the dog did nothing. Precisely, Watson, Holmes answered. Precisely. Now that, my dear listeners, is precisely the sort of clue you now have in your possession. And like Watson, must figure out for yourselves. I can almost hear Holmes saying... But consider the coat, Watson, the imitation leopard skin coat, and Watson answering. But the coat is valueless, Holmes. And Holmes nodding wisely as he replies, precisely, Watson, precisely. Now, shall we go on? Joe. Hello. Contact ballistics. I'm fabrics. They're bullets. And that's what you want to know about. Joe, Joe, listen. 
Granted, I have what you call a special flair for forensic, but... Okay, okay. I'll look into it. Yeah. Yeah. Leave it to me, Joe. Bye. Lieutenant Maxwell. Show him in. Come in, uh, Mr. North, Miss Corbin. Thank, Thank you. you, Lieutenant. Sit down, please. Coffee? Uh, no, thanks. Rose? Uh, no, thank you. Well, here's your coat, Miss Corbin. We found nothing. Not a thing. Nothing? I'll level with you, Mr. North. When you brought this coat in the other night, I figured, well, there's something and I'll find it. Like there had to be something. You know what I mean? I mean, who offers 1,000 clamps for an imitation leopard skin coat, then gets herself murdered an hour later? Who crashes his car against another guy's car on the triborough yet and tries to grab the coat off a of dame? Who? Somebody that wants something in that coat. That's who. Yes, but you found nothing. I have personally put this coat through every test we know. Every inch of it has been examined under the microscope, the X-ray, the fluoroscope. We took the lining apart. Oh. And don't worry. We put it back together again better than before. It's beautiful. And, uh, pull the blank. Well, I don't get it, Lieutenant. I mean, if it was just that woman uh, willing to pay $1,000 for this coat, but, but a guy crashing his car into mine on the bridge, then trying to rip that coat off Rose, uh, Miss Corman... Lieutenant, there's got to be something about this coat. Well, I felt the same way myself, Mr. North, but there's nothing. No invisible markings, nothing hidden in the seams, nothing between the layers of the fabric and the collar, nothing. So to be honest with you, I don't get it either. Excuse me, could I ask a question? Certainly. What about the woman, Simone Laveau? Have you found out why she was murdered? No, I checked a couple of times with homicide... Last time, 20 minutes ago. We got nothing here on her. Us, the FBI, the T-Boys. Right now, we're checking the CIA and Interpol. They could maybe have something, but it'll take a little time. Well, thanks, uh, Lieutenant. Uh, You'll let us know if anything turns up? You'd better believe it, Mr. North. So much for the coat, Rose. I mean, that's that, I guess. What would you like to do? Oh, don't you have to get back to your office? Yeah, well, not until late this afternoon. I scheduled my day so I could spend most of it with you. <laughs> Say, I know. How about the Museum of Art? We could spend a few hours there, even have lunch, if you'd like that. Oh, how wonderful, Hank. Only, I don't like the idea of having to carry this coat around all day. But, well, you won't have to. I mean, we'll check it at the museum, Okay. Okay. <laughs> hey, taxi! Taxi! Enjoy a sandwich, Rose? Oh, yes, I am. Oh, I'm so full. You Americans make much bigger sandwiches than we do in Britain. <laughs> the American way. Everything on a big scale. Ah. <laughs> well, do you feel up to looking at some more paintings? Hank, would you mind? I really don't. Two hours walking around those galleries up oh, there. Sure, sure, you're tired. Look, I'll tell you what, I'll, I'll drop you off at home and then uh, head downtown to my office. Are you sure you don't mind? Oh, to be honest, Rose, I do. I mean, I want to spend as much time with you as I can. You want to stop and look at the Greek and Roman sarcophaguses, sarcophagi, <laughs> tombs? <laughs> no. no, I've seen enough. Let's just get my coat from the check room and go home, where I can rest these aching feet. Whatever you say, Cousin Rose. Hey, there's something going on over there. I should say so. There's a big crowd around the check room. Police. Hank, what do you suppose has happened? I don't know. We're going to have a rough time, though, getting through that crowd to reclaim your coat. Uh, excuse me. Yeah. Uh, you know what's going on over there? There's been a murder, I think. A murder? Yeah, a robbery or a theft or whatever it's called. Anyway, somebody stole a coat. A coat? Yeah, that's what I heard. You, uh, you don't happen to know what kind of coat? Yeah, I, I, I think they said a leopard skin coat, somebody said. Imitation leopard. <laughs> Another cup, Rose. Oh, thank you. 
I'm getting to like coffee. Oh, is that another way of saying you don't care for my tea? Oh, no. No? <laughs> uh, tea or coffee, when you when you finish that, I think you'd be smart to stretch out for a while, have yourself a nap. I mean, you've, you've had kind of a rough day. Mm, tiring, anyhow. Well, at least you're rid of that coat once and for all. Now, you don't have to worry about that anymore. But you don't, dear. I don't. I, I, well, I just don't know. I'm, I'm not so sure. What do you mean? I have sort of... Oh, I, I don't know. A feeling that what happened at the museum today isn't the end of all this. For me, I mean. Oh, now, now, it's nothing more than nerves, my dear. It's just nerves. Perhaps, but I don't think so. Maybe it's the mystery of the thing. Not knowing why someone wanted that coat badly enough to kill for it. Murder for it. Looks like we'll never know now. Well, look, it's it's over now, and, and we can forget it, as Mother says. And now, if you ladies will excuse me. Well, where are you going? To the office. Oh, but this late in the afternoon, it's after four. <laughs> and the brief I wanted to finish up at three is still waiting to be finished. Now, Hank, you worked too hard. Couldn't it wait until tomorrow? Don't forget, there's the theater tonight. I'll be back at 6.30, the latest. So don't... I'll get it. Hello? That you, Mr. North? Yes. Lieutenant Maxwell? Yeah, I tried you at your office. They said I might find you at home. Uh, are you going to be there another hour or so? Well, if it's important... Uh... I think it is. I've got the answer. Anyhow, I think I've got the answer to our little mystery. I want to come over and check it out. Yeah, well, sure, but what is the answer? One thing, Mr. North, we got a report from the Paris branch of Interpol on the Simone Laveau woman. Yeah, what about her? She was a foreign agent, one of the higher-ups in the spy ring. A spy ring? Spy ring? Yeah, now, uh, the way I figure it, she, uh... Oh, wait just a minute. Yeah, what is it, Eddie? Lieutenant Maxwell says Simone Laveau was a foreign agent, part of a spy ring. Oh, good heavens. Hello? Hello, Mr. North. Yes, you, Lieutenant. Listen, uh, something's just come up here. I gotta hang up. But I'll be at your place in over, uh, say, half an hour. Wait a minute. Uh, what's the answer to the mystery? I'll see you in half an hour. Lieutenant, don't leave us hanging like... Well, I'll be. Well, what was all that about, Hank? Well, Maxwell says he has the answer to the mystery, or he thinks he has. He'll be over here in half an hour to check it out. What is the answer? He didn't tell me. He got called away on something. He had to hang up. Well... Who are you calling? The office. That brief will have to wait uh -huh. until tomorrow now. Where is he? Well, give him time, Mother. Give him time. But, but it's nearly six o'clock. He should have been here at least an hour ago. And we are going to the theater tonight, remember? Yeah, well, we may have to skip that. I'm so sorry, Aunt Ruth. Oh, that's all right, my dear. It's not your fault. Well, somehow I feel it is. Rose, how could it possibly be your fault? Well, I'm the one who bought that silly coat at Harrods. And if I hadn't bought it, none of this oh, would have happened. happened. Not to you, perhaps, but certainly to someone else. If someone did buy it. Now, for all we know, if you hadn't bought it, it could still be hanging on the rack in London. Yes, well, I wish it were. It isn't nerves, Aunt Ruth. It's, it's knowing that because of that coat, two people were murdered. Hank and I came close to death in that car crash, and... Uh, well, wait, it, it's just too much. Oh, I couldn't agree more. Uh-oh. Ah, this must be Lieutenant Maxwell. Okay, okay, I'm coming. Lieutenant. Uh, your... Lieutenant! Uh, an ambulance. Hank, what... Oh, my heavens, Hank, be quick. He's collapsing. Yeah, I've got him. Mother, call an ambulance. Yeah, an ambulance. Hank, is he hurt badly? Uh, my back. My life. All right, let me get him onto the couch. Uh, okay, look, get his coat off. Right. And his shirt. No, too late. Yeah, the name is Lord. Finish. Finish. Oh, that's Lord. what you think. That's right. Uh, Rose, uh, the medicine cabinet in the bathroom. Yes, Bandages. Yes, iodine. Yes, all right. Quite a no. Listen, look, you better not talk. Just let me get these things off you, so I... The ambulance oh. is on the way. Oh. Oh, my God. Yeah. Lord, I've never seen so much. Bless it. Oh. Yes, yes, Lieutenant. The guy that did this. How did he do it? Not much time. She, she, Rose, life in danger. Rose's life? In danger? Yes. She, uh. Man's in agony. Yes, some bandages and some iodine. Lieutenant, the guy that did this must fall out. I know. I know the answer to the coat. Listen now. Go on. 
Only one that knows me. My heart is bugged. Got to be. Tell them. Headquarters. Tell them. Bug. Sure, sure. Count on it. What is the answer, Lieutenant? The code. Not. 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 What do you mean, not? Not what? Lieutenant. Oh. Is he. Yes. Oh. Oh, the poor man. Another death. Oh, we never see the end of this. Why are you looking at me like that? Hank, on Ruth. What is it? Tell me. He said, your life's in danger now. Mine? Yes, dear. But it can't be. How can it be? I I haven't got the coat anymore. No, but... But what? They've got the coat. They've got what they were after. Why would they kill me? I don't know. But I better find out, honey. I damn well better find out. He'd certainly better do just that, or Rose Corbin, the very attractive young woman Hank North has fallen in love with, may not live much longer. But how can he find out the answer to this baffling mystery? Where does one start? What does one do? Where would you start? What would you do? I'll be back shortly for Act Three. Well, now, let's see where we are. Rose Corbin arrived in the United States from London, England, wearing an imitation leopard skin coat. On her arrival, a woman named Simone Laveau tried to buy the coat, and when Rose refused to sell, tried to take it away from her. Later, Simone Laveau was murdered aboard the plane, taking her to Paris. Since then, the coat seems to have triggered two more murders, that of a checkroom attendant at the Museum of Art, at which time the murderer made off with the coat, and, as we heard only minutes ago, that of Lieutenant Maxwell of the police. All right, Rose, let's go over it and over it. Hank, we've gone over it and over it. I know, but Maxwell said your life is in danger now, and Rose, if anything happened to you... Well, it isn't going to, not if I can help it. You bought the coat in Harrods the day before you took off to visit us here. Yes. And no one accosted you at Heathrow before you boarded the plane or on the plane. Nobody even mentioned the coat. No, no one. But the minute you got off the plane at Kennedy International, this uh, Simone Laveau... Well, not the minute I got off the plane. First, I went to the florist to buy the flower... The rose I said I'd wear so you'd recognize me. Yeah, but just after that... She came up to me and asked to buy the coat and got very upset when I said I wouldn't sell it. I mean, practically began to tear it off me. I just don't get it. We know there was nothing hidden in the coat. No invisible message, no... Nothing. But we do know that Simone Laveau was a foreign agent. Now, there's just got to be some connection between the coat and her being a foreign agent. There's got to be. Hank, dear... Why don't we forget it till after we've had dinner? We're all so tired and upset. Yeah, you're right, you're right, you're right. Go and get ready and um, we'll take off for Antonelli's, huh? I won't be long. All right. What? Who are you? What are you doing there? Rose, what is it? Hank. Hank. What's the matter? What? There's a man here in my room. He's just fled there. He's gone out the window. Two doctors say he's probably down the fire escape by now. What was he doing? Well, see for yourself. I mean, look at the mess he made of my dressing table. He was going through the drawers. Your jewel case. Well, there's junk jewelry, most of it. Oh, this is all we need right now. A sneak thief on top of everything else. Check your things. See what he got away with, if anything. Look, I'll call the police. (laughs) And to what, Mr. North, do I owe this royal treatment? Royal treatment? Well, the call from your secretary saying to meet you at five o'clock at this swank watering hole and, and then the arrival by <laughs> absolutely lovely little nosegay with instructions to wear it. <laughs> well, you leave tomorrow for England and there's something I want to say to you. Something important. Uh, that's why I wanted to meet you here alone and without mother this time. And, well, as for the little nosegay, it's 
Just a little something to make the occasion. <laughs> well, here I am, wearing my most attractive suit and the nosegay. So what do you want to say? Uh, good afternoon. May I take your order? Uh, martini, Rose? Rose? What? Martini? Oh, uh, yes. Uh, two martinis, waiter. Uh, very dry. Yes, sir. Would Madame Bell like me to take your jacket? Take my jacket? It's a bit warm in here this afternoon, and no, I thought... No, thank you. I'm quite comfortable. Certainly, Madame. Two martinis. Well, now, Rose, what I wanted to say... Something wrong? No, no. I, I was just wondering if I'd seen that waiter somewhere before. Not likely. Well, now, um... Yes. Well, now what? Rose, we've uh, only known each other for a few weeks, but in that short time, I... I've fallen in love with you, and I want you to marry me. Will you? Of course. Of course? <laughs> Just like that? What did you expect me to say? Oh, sir, this is so sudden. <laughs> <laughs> no, but... I'm in love with you, too, Hank. Head over heels. Oh, Rose. Well, I guess it's time then for me to give you this. <gasps> oh, Hank. Oh, it's gorgeous. Oh, darling, that diamond must have cost a fortune. <laughs> You're worth a fortune. Hold out your hand. There. Oh, thank you, dearest. Thank you so much. Hmm. Well, if that's only a sample, I've underrated you. You're worth a queen's rats. We are so to Martini. Ah, thank you. One for Madame. Oh, oh. oh Madame, I'm oh, sorry. You spilled it all over my jacket. Oh, forgive me, Madame. Forgive me for one of those things. It just slipped from my fingers. Oh. But... Allow me, I will take care of everything. Let me have the jacket, madame, and I will dry it in no, the kitchen. It's all right, I can wipe it with my napkin. Uh, no, madame, it is my fault. You must allow Please, me. Will to... you take your hands off me? I said I. I, I but I insist. All right, yeah, will you stop? I only wish. Well, the lady doesn't wish. Now just forget it and then bring another martini. Uh, yes, sir. Very good, sir. Oh, I'm awfully sorry this happened, darling. Are you sure you. Rose, what. That. That waiter. What about him? I remember now. Why does he want this coat? This jacket? What? First he wanted me to take it off, pretending it was hot in here. And, and spilling that drink just now was no accident. He did it deliberately. Rose, I don't understand. Hank, he is the man who caused that accident on our way from the airport. The man who tried to rip the leopard skin coat off me. Oh, Hank, what is this all about? <laughs> Oh, that's your flight they just called. I have a good trip home, Rose, and we'll be looking forward to seeing you again in a week or ten days, dear. Quicker than that, Aunt Ruth, if I can wind up my affairs in London sooner. Oh, don't look so down in the mouth, darling. Well, I don't like even letting you out of my sight, Rose, especially after last night. That waiter... It'll be all right, darling. Don't worry. Oh, and thank you for the rose. Well, that's our flower, like, uh, you know, our song. <laughs> you arrive wearing a rose, you depart wearing one. Goodbye, sweetheart. Dearest. Goodbye, Aunt Ruth. <laughs> Not goodbye, Rose. Au revoir. <laughs> now, don't worry about the wedding now. I'll arrange everything. Oh, dear. dear. I'll see you in a week. Ten days at most. At most. Now, shall we go out and watch the takeoff, Hank? Could that be it? Could it? Could what be what, Hank? What, what are you talking about? The coat she was wearing when she arrived. The jacket she was wearing last night. Good Lord. The jacket she's wearing now. Could it be that? What in the world are you... I've been thinking. I've been thinking. What did Lieutenant Maxwell mean when he said, just before he died, said, the coat not... Not. No, I know. It wasn't the coat at all. It wasn't the jacket. If I'm right, they... They are after... What? Hey, after what? A flower pinned to Rose's lapel, Mother. Not the coat. Not the jacket. The flower. <laughs> Well, 
airborne at last and headed for the old England, young lady. Hmm? Oh, yes. And since we're seated next to each other, let me introduce myself. Emil Denko. Rose Corbin. Have you been visiting uh, in the States long? Not really. A few weeks. I'm going to... Uh, how did you know that? Well, how did I know? Well, that I was visiting in the States. I could be living there. I could be an American citizen, for all you know. I, uh, uh, I assumed uh, uh, your accent. Who are you? Behind those dark glasses. <laughs> You're a very perceptive young woman, Miss Corbin. No, don't. Not a move. Or I'll give you what I gave Simone Laveau. That's it. No quick moves, no panic. Good. Just relax now. Enjoy the trip. I will be at Heathrow Airport before you know it. Enjoy the trip. I would if I were you. It's the last trip you're ever going to make. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well? We're to go to the operations office at once. He said he'd have a government agent there by then. Come on. Why won't you tell me? There is no need for you to know. Since you're going to kill me when we get to Heathrow. No, not at Heathrow. I'll take you to my place in London, in Soho. And really, I'm sorry about the need to kill you. But I must. Why? Why must you? Because you know my face. And in my business... That's a serious liability uh, for the victim. But to uh, be a good cheer, the more I look at you, the more I'm inclined to let you live for uh, some little time. I don't understand. You're a very desirable woman, Miss Corbin. Very desirable. <laughs> Yes, Hank, what... The what? government men said to wait here. Yes, but... Wait. They're going to radio the pilot. Oh. I gave them as clear a description of the man, uh, the guy who tried to get the coat from Rose in that accident on the bridge and who palmed himself off as a waiter last night. And then what? Well, he'll check the plane. You know, the way the captain comes through the plane now and then, chats with the passengers. Yes, and then... And then well, he'll he... check to see if this guy's on the plane. And uh, if he is... Yes, and, and if he is, what? We'll take it from there, he said. The government man. We'll take it from there. Oh. Did you enjoy the movie? Uh, are you joking? Uh, uh, just uh, making small talk. If you must talk, why not tell me what it is you want? Why did you cause that accident on the Triborough Bridge and try to get the jacket I had on last night? What is it you're off? Patience, Miss Corbin. We'll be landing at the Heathrow in half an hour. Another hour or so, we'll be at my place in Soho. And perhaps an hour or so after that, I'll tell you. And uh, perhaps not. <laughs> Mother, there are at least a dozen plainclothes police and government men down there disguised as airport attendants. The minute they disembark, there. Oh. They blow the landing platform in place. The door is open. Yes, well, that man, whoever he is, discovers that this isn't he. Oh, don't worry. Everything has been arranged. Oh. There they are. Rose and the man. There's a captain right behind them. Oh. And they're walking right into the arms of... Oh, oh they put up a fight. It was as simple as that, Rose. I mean, the captain turned the plane around and circled Kennedy International for a few hours, uh, pretending you were flying to Heathrow. He fooled me, but not him. Halfway down the steps of that landing platform, he realized... And he foolishly tried to shoot things out. Oh, I know. I suppose I ought to feel sorry for him, but I just... It's understandable. Oh, it's, it's all just unbelievable. 
And I think that because I said I'd wear a rose and bought one at the airport when I arrived... Well, the attendant at the florist shop, an agent who'd been planted there, would never have mistaken you for Simone Livreau and pinned that rose to your lapel with... Well, I guess you could call it the fatal pin. Now, you know, I'm still not sure I've got this straight, dear. Now, let me see. She, on her way to Paris, was to go into the florist shop wearing a leopard skin coat and ask for a rose, right? Now, that was the agent's cue to use the, um, what you call the fatal pin? Uh, exactly. Uh, see, Emil Tenko knew he was under surveillance, and so he had a problem. I mean, how to get that top secret information out of the country. So he had it engraved on the head of a pin. You know, Aunt Ruth, the way they engraved the Lord's Prayer on a pinhead. Mm. The trouble began when the agent thought that I was Simone Laveau on her way to Paris, wearing an almost identical leopard skin coat to mine. And naturally, when Rose threw the rose away after it wilted, she kept the pin and used it again last night, the pin on the nosegay I gave her. <laughs> it's all over, and thank heaven it is. Rose, how about some dinner? I'm starving, but... Before we go, I am going to change out of this suit into a dress. Oh, and Hank, dear. Yes, sweetheart. No flowers, please. Not for a long, long time. No flowers, please. And so, as you see, like all good, seemingly insoluble mysteries... The solution to Roses Are for Funerals was very simple indeed. In fact, I even gave you a clue in the puzzle. What could be fairer than that? I'll be back shortly. Mysteries, it seems to me, are like a magic show. Like the magician, the author shows you everything, but directs your attention elsewhere. Perhaps I should say misdirects it. So be on your guard next time. Oh yes, there will be a next time. And although I'll always play 100% fair with you, I warn you now, I'll do all I can to mislead you. Can you blame me? Our cast included Carol Shelley, Tony Roberts... Mildred Clinton, and Dan Ocko. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now, a preview of our next tale. You're like an animal, always sniffing around. You're disgusting. You disgust me. Give me those keys. I'm asking you for the last time. I'm not going to give you any keys of mine so you can go sniffing around that lady doctor. No, sir. All right, I'll take a cab. No, you won't. Won't take any cab. Not while I'm alive, you won't. Get away from that door, Mother. I'll stand here till hell freezes over before I let you go rushing off to that woman. Mother, get away from never, the door. Never, never, I'm never going to let you be an animal anymore. Mother! Stop it, damn it, you stop it. <laughs> you hear me, you stop it. Oh, 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 Lord, oh, Mother, my... Oh, oh God. I'm terribly sorry. My sorry. Oh, I... I Oh, Mother. I'm sorry, Mother. I, how, how could you? Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by Anheuser Busch Incorporated, Brewers of Budweiser, and Sign Off, the sinus medicines. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. <laughs> <laughs> 